Welcome back to the third phase of Moon. My name is Blake Cousins. In this groundbreaking documentary, we're going to explore alien abduction and strange implants extracted from people from around the world. Dr. Roger Lear has performed 16 surgeries and has removed 17 implants that are extraterrestrial in origin. We'll show you the objects he's removed and reveal why they are described as a smoking gun that prove that visitors from other planets are routinely visiting Earth and keeping tabs on the inhabitants. Also, we'll be speaking to alien abductees and patients of Dr. Roger Lear who've had alien implants removed from their bodies. 15-year-old Jack Graham will be our special correspondent on location in Los Angeles asking Dr. Roger Lear the questions if we are alone in the universe. As one of the most eloquent and intelligent investigators of extraterrestrial life, we'll hear Dr. Lear's observations on why the aliens are interested in our planet and what their plan is for the human race. Now, where in the body do most implants usually come from? Well, that's an interesting question of where we find them in the body. Uh, what we've come to the conclusion is that they have to be in areas that are relatively superficial and near a bone. We've never found one in a body cavity such as the thorax or the abdomen or the brain. Now, we've also come to the conclusion that maybe this is necessary because the electronics of the mechanism we found that this may be necessary because it's broadcasting a signal. And when you broadcast a signal, you, at least according to human technology, you have to have an antenna. And what better antenna could be than the skeleton of the body? It contains all the minerals necessary for an antenna. So perhaps that's why they're in such association with bone. The other aspect of it is if you're doing millions of these and you're doing them all over the world, and there's a large number of abductees with Oprah Pohl in 1993-1996, says that at least 2% of the American population is involved in alien abduction, and that was a conservative poll because there's a lot of people who are not going to want to answer these questions at all. And then if you multiply that by the world's population, you're talking about a lot of people. So uh, to get remote information as to what is going on within the human body, like we, we tag bears, I mean, we tag porpoises and uh, whales and so on, and we can study their, their habits, uh, how long a bear hibernates, you know, what their metabolism is during the winter time and so on. Even John Glenn, or an astronaut, complained on national television that he had to swallow implants because mission control had to have that you know physiological information. Now, well, one of the things that we haven't talked about at all is why are implants there in the first place? Now, why exactly do you think that implants are necessary? Well, I think, again, based on human logic, and let's say, you know, uh, the human race is in a state of infancy because we haven't been around that long. A race that may be hundreds, thousands, or maybe millions of years older than we are may not use the same logic as we do. So the answer I'm going to give you is based on our human logic. It looks like to me that the entire human race is being genetically re-manipulated again. Because if you look at the children born within the last 60, 75 years, they are not the same human as a person who was my age. In fact, uh, a gentleman by the name of John White, who used to put on UFO conferences in the state of Connecticut, years ago came up, recognized this, and he came up with the term homo noeticus instead of homo sapien, homo noeticus, and that means new human. If you listen to what a child has to say today, and ask them or get a feeling for where they get their knowledge from. It's not from a book. It's not from TV. It's not off the computer. They already know it. It's a different 
kind of human being. So if you're doing a genetic manipulation on a population, you might want to know exactly what's going on genetically without having to abduct the individual again. So you would do it remotely, like as I stated previously with what we do with lesser animals. Now, would you, for example, reach into uh, the ocean and pull out a fish and tell the fish, I'm going to put a tag on you so I can know what your swimming habits are, or what you eat? No, they would just pull, we would pull the fish out, do our thing, put them back. We do it with manatees. I just watched Animal Planet this morning. The, the, the manatee doesn't know they have a broadcasting device. We don't explain it to them that we want to learn about their metabolism and their eating habits and so on. So they just do it. Well, that's, you know, kind of what they're doing with us. They put these uh, devices in so that possibly they can gain remote information without ever having to come back and abduct us again. Now, which is another interesting thing, I've been asked, well, how come I can take them out? Do, do well, aliens want it to be found? Do the, well, you know, that, that's a good question. Do aliens want it to be found? And if they, if they didn't, I guess I wouldn't be taking them out. You know, and then I get asked, well, who else is doing this? And as far as I know, I'm the only person in the world. And I did research. You know, prior to the time I did the first one, even though I thought it was going to be a funny, funny joke, 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 I wanted to see how many implants were taken out previously. And all I did was I read through the UFO literature and I saw that things were taken out. They turned to powder, they disappear, they dropped, they did this, they do it, but nobody ever came up with anything. And so I do cases and I come up with actual physical objects that can be sent to material scientific laboratories and get opinions. I mean, you know, I, I can't explain that. That's, that's strange. And if somebody had told me, you know, 50 years ago, that I would ever be doing anything like this, or would have traveled to 42 countries, or have done the things that I've done, or have done the television programs and radio programs that I've done, I would have told them they were nuts. Now, I know you uh, removed many implants. How similar are the implants to one another? Are they each clones of themselves, or do they vary? <laughs> well, the implants that we have removed uh, in the past, we have about seven that look exactly the same. And if you lined them all up on gauze sponges, you would never tell one from the other. We have a few that are, are different, but I have synthetically divided them into three categories. Ones that are metallic and covered with a biological coating, ones that are non-metallic, and one that is biological. And uh, each uh, operates a little bit differently. But the ones, the seven that we have that are metallic rods with biological coatings are virtually all the same. Now, do you personally believe that you've been contacted by aliens? Uh, I would have to say uh, the answer to that is yes. Uh, I can tell you an episode that occurred with uh, my family, my daughter and myself uh, in Laughlin some years ago, which I wrote a book, uh, I wrote a part of a book called Chop Liver. And we talked about that incident, but um, during the awards banquet that we were having, at the conference, uh, I was asked to come outside with my family. So there was a lot of people who were lined up at the uh, at the fence along the uh, Colorado River, and I, we were in back of a, a lady in a white dress. And I said, "What? What's going on? What's happening here?" She said, "Oh, you missed them. You missed them. There was about seven of them out here." And I said, seven what?" She said, seven craft." I said, oh, well, I started looking around and I didn't see anything. And, you know, if you start staring at objects in the heavens, uh, the, your eye muscles begin to twitch. And I thought, well, you know, these people are having what's called nocturnal nystigmas is the word for it. And then suddenly, uh, like in the movie, A Beautiful Mind, 
where you can look up at the heavens and you can find any geograph uh, any geometric uh, concentration of stars that you want to see. There's there's thousands, millions of them there. You know, so we our attention was called to a triangle of stars. Now there was a big, bright, full moon, really bright. And right below the moon was this triangle of stars, and the, the all 40 people seemed to be concentrating on this triangle of stars. And then suddenly the bottom two stars started to move, and they came downward, and they went into a pair, and they slowly went towards the corona of the moonlight and disappeared. And uh, at the same time, I think everyone there got a telepathic message. Yes, we're here. Believe it. Bye bye. And my daughter, who was about 12 years old at the time, said, Dad, are those folks coming back again? So, yes, I, I believe I have been contacted by non terrestrial beings. It's fascinating. Now, what would you say is the most credible argument you've ever heard for abduction? Well, the most credible, credible argument that I've heard for abduction in the cases that we've done surgery on uh, would be very hard to delineate because when we set up our set of criteria and protocols, uh, the individual must have some kind of a memory of being associated with the abduction phenomena. When when Bob Bigelow or NIDS decided to take on this this responsibility of doing the metallurgy, I had to do some studying so that I could just interpret what they had to say. And I got so we started getting reports back, and uh, the first report we got back was he was they were comparing this was Los Alamos National Laboratory. Mm -hmm. They were comparing these to meteorite samples. Wow. Well, we know if somebody didn't step on a meteorite or get one whacked through the back of his hand, it wouldn't have So it has, to, it has to come from outer space. It had to come from outer space, and they're calling them meteorite samples. So that was rather mind-blowing. So that was the beginning of the scientific aspect. So I figured, well, you know, if we're going to carry on with this, we better set up some scientific protocols and criteria for doing this kind of work. Uh, and then we formed our 501c3 nonprofit organization, ANS Research, and uh, no charges that were then ever made to um, any of the surgical candidates. I see. Now, I know, because you, you've written a lot of books, clearly, most people must have heard about them. How many people ask you, can you inspect me and see if I have any alien implants inside my body? Do you get a lot of emails per day? Well, I get a tremendous amount of emails, uh, sometimes 3,500 a day. Wow. <laughs> and uh, yes, we have now instituted a methodology, a scientific methodology, for looking at the possibilities of whether somebody might have an object in their body. <laughs> and Steve uh, and I both have uh, equipment that we can go, for example, to a conference. Let's say, you know, tomorrow, an alien revealed himself to the general public. How would you say people would react? Would there be mayhem and riots, or how would it go? Well, if the alien presence were known uh, suddenly, you know, one day. For example, I always I like to use the example of a huge uh, multi-football field alien craft <laughs> landing on a busy freeway during rush hour. Would there be a panic? Uh, the answer is yes, there would be a panic because people would be on their cell phones calling Caltrans to see how long they were going to have to sit there before that thing got <laughs> out of the way so they could go back to get home to watch the Lakers game. Mm -hmm. But see, it just indicates the, the quality of life that we have here in the United States. Probably the least important thing of uh, an, an individual who lives in the United States, at least, uh, is uh, extraterrestrial beings. As long as it doesn't interfere with you personally, then it could be fine, or it could be not fine, or who, who cares? Mm -hmm. But because that relationship has been made fun of for so many years, well, we don't even take it, uh, the common uh, person doesn't even take it seriously. 
So the world is changing and the world has got to know, finally know the truth. You know, uh, government sources and private industry has taken over most of the knowledge of, you know, the extraterrestrial presence. Yeah. I guess, do you have any good guesses as to why aliens would contact us? You know, what, what, makes, uh, what makes us stand out that aliens would want to put their implants inside of us? Well, I think in order to understand what the alien approach is to human life on Earth, we have to have a good understanding of our history which we don't and which nobody seems to care about except a few. But if you go back and you look at ancient history and you look at ancient paintings and wood carvings and so on, even liturgical paintings with Jesus, you're going to look up and you're going to see a typical saucer UFO craft mm -hmm. flying around even yeah. back in those days. So, you know, we don't know where we came from. We've been looking for the missing link for year after year after year. Where's the missing link? If we look at the writings of uh, Zachariah Sitchin, the late Zachariah Sitchin just passed away, um, and he wrote a set of books called The Earth Chronicles, and he says that 435,000 years ago, from another planet in our solar system called Nibiru, the uh, group uh, race of individuals called the Anunnaki came here and their head geneticist whose name was Enki manipulated what was already here into human beings wow. so if we don't understand the history of, of uh, where we came from in the first place how can we possibly understand that the present or the future of where we're going with all this. Jack Graham will now speak to Stephen Colburn, chemist and material scientist, in regards to the implants removed by the alien abductees. So, can you tell me a bit about yourself and your role within this program? Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, my name is Steve Colburn. I'm a material scientist. Um, I was educated at UCLA. And um, I uh, work in Camarillo, just a few blocks from where uh, Dr. Lear works. And um, uh, after we met, um, uh, we decided to have a collaboration on uh, analyzing these objects more thoroughly. Um, a lot of the objects that he'd removed had not been analyzed um, adequately. So um, uh, I have uh, done a lot of uh, microscopy and um, elemental analysis on these objects and uh, come up with some interesting findings. Um, one thing we found out is that um, the devices are definitely nanotechnological, uh, <coughs> nanotechnological devices. Um, they're not just simply uh, metallic objects that somehow got into the body. Um, they contain carbon nanotube electronics, and carbon nanotubes are the field I'm working in in my, my regular job. Um, and uh, they give off radio signals, um, and um, they have uh, odd nanostructures in them made of carbon nanotubes. Uh, carbon nanotube electronics are a uh, hot topic in material science today, uh, by the way, and there's many amazing properties about them. The aliens have, have apparently perfected the technology to use carbon nanotubes in these devices. And um, uh, there are proprioceptor nerves that, that um, go into these, uh, the tissue capsule or a gray uh, membrane around these devices. And um, well, one, of the, one of the most fascinating findings was that um, that these devices contain, uh, many of them contain meteoric iron uh, from the, uh, judging from the trace element pattern of um, gallium, germanium, uh, uh, precious metals like iridium and platinum, and iridium is not found on Earth in any great amounts. And um, uh, we did the isotopic analysis of uh, various elements from the metallic cores of several of these devices and found out that um, they uh, were made from off-planet material, um, extraterrestrial material. Um, there's a certain pattern of isotopes uh, for each element on Earth, and if, if that pattern is, uh, is varying by more than a percent or so, then it's, um, uh, a, um, the conclusion can be drawn that, it came, that the material came from off-planet. Um, and uh, some of the isotopic ratios and the elements in these um, devices are extremely skewed compared to uh, quite unlike um, uh, the uh, isotopic uh, ratios of elements on Earth. Um, in fact, uh, Dr. Koontz, our colleague, uh, who's also involved in the research, um, concluded that uh, they probably came from um, 
somewhere else in the galaxy. Uh, they don't even seem to be from our solar system. Uh, these um, devices have uh, carbon nanotube networks inside the metal. Um, so um, they're obviously manufactured devices and they seem to be uh, well beyond uh, the technology for, of civilian science at this point. So it's not possible that this something like the nanotubes could it be made through nature. It has to be manufactured. No, they were discovered in 1991 um, in uh, Western science. The Russians discovered them perhaps 10 years before that. Um, but uh, they're not known to be found in nature, um, and uh, certainly not in, uh, in meteorites. Um, so there's no way that it could be faked, really? No, I don't think so. I, I, th th some people have argued that these devices could be made by black government projects, but I, I think that the fact that they contain extraterrestrial material argues strongly against that. So what you're saying that this is, it was discovered in 1991, right, the, the nano... The yeah, and many of these objects and date, they date, from, before. date from well before the discovery of carbon nanotubes in, uh, in science on Earth. Um, these um, people re reported uh, that these objects were put in you know, like 30, 40 years before a lot of times. So, so when you say nanotubes, do you mean that these, these things could be used to store information, perhaps? Um, yeah, they're, they can be made into uh, electronic networks. Um, carbon nanotubes are, um, they're um, like... Uh, let me give you a little bit of background. Graphite is um, a hexagonal array of carbon atoms, and the, these arrays, these layers, are stacked. If you take one of these layers, one of these hex hexagonal arrays of carbon atoms, and roll it up into a tube, that's a carbon nanotube. And uh, there's um, various types of carbon nanotubes with different uh, numbers of walls, and single wall are the most uh, studied right now, and these, these contain single wall carbon nanotubes. Single wall carbon nanotubes are um, often less than a nanometer in diameter. These are small diameter single wall carbon nanotubes that are in these devices, and they, those can be used as electronics because there are uh, metallic and semiconducting single wall carbon nanotubes. So you're saying this is very tightly stacked, and if you took out all the, if you laid it end to end, it would definitely be a lot larger than it would. So all this information is tightly stored together, compacted? Yeah, I, I would think so, yeah. The, the total length of the carbon nanotubes in one of these things might be several miles. I've, uh, I haven't figured it out, but wow. it's got to be a lot. So the technology? used to compact that much information so tightly seems to be pretty futuristic. Definitely. I don't understand how the, uh, the metal could actually be put around the carbon nanotubes uh, without uh, destroying the nanotubes because the, the melting point of these metals is like 1500 degrees Celsius and um, if you poured molten metal over the carbon nanotubes it would just destroy them or uh, convert them to metal carbides. So would it be possible to say that the information required to make one of these carbon nanotubes isn't readily available on Earth? It must well, have come from somewhere make, else? We can make carbon nanotubes, but to make, to make a um, 3D intricate composite like this with carbon nanotube electronics inside the metal, that's well beyond our technology at this point. Physio we've speculated that they might be physiological monitoring devices or listening devices. Um, they're definitely relaying information about the subject uh, to uh, the aliens um, through um, radio signals. They're not always transmitting, so... Um, have you noticed actual radio signals emitting oh yeah. from it? We've detected radio signals coming from them, and uh, in two of my reports, we outlined some of the frequencies that they give off. Uh, the last two devices we uh, detected radio signals from. Are they common radio signals that are found on Earth? Uh, some of them are uh, aeronautical and satellite communication frequencies, uh, but um, the, there's also a very high frequency microwave uh, uh, discharges as well. So could it be possibly dangerous to have a lot of microwaves emitting from inside a person? Uh, I wouldn't say it's a lot of microwaves. We've only detected perhaps milliwatt levels of power, um, but um, it's hard to say. I, it's, there's been no uh, ill effects noted from uh, anybody having these uh, devices inside them. What about after the surgery? Has there been? They, uh, they don't have um, any rejection or uh, immune response by the body. So that you, it's possible to not even notice these tiny things in your body? Yeah, most people don't notice them at all. Um, so would it be fair to say that on an X-ray? Would it be fair to say that there might be a lot of those in a lot of different type of people? Oh, well, that's very safe to say. Wow. Some of the frequencies that we've been able to gain some knowledge of from uh, from classified information is that they are deep space fixed fixed or mobile deep space frequencies. And that presents quite a conundrum because. Um, what advanced civilization would be using a radio wave to begin with. So do you think it would be possible that the government could know about these nanotube technologies? 
I think they know about them. I don't think they can reproduce it as yet, but um, it's anybody's guess how much technology the Black Project community has. Some of, the, some of their stuff is reverse engineered alien technology reportedly. So would it be possible to take this apart and perhaps learn the secrets of what's inside it and perhaps use it for our own technology? That's what we'd like to do at some point. We'd like to uh, take one of these devices and um, uh, do um, mount, it, um, mount it vertically on um, a scanning electron microscope uh, mount and um, take um, an elemental map of one layer of the object then etch away a layer with um, uh, a beam of fast atoms and then uh, and do the, the next layer and get a three-dimensional structure of the object that way. How strong is the object? Is it easy to break? Uh, this one, I don't know. I haven't tried to cut it yet. Um, most of them are fairly easy to break. I've, I've cut, um, I've cut uh, four so far and three of them are fairly easy to break. One was immensely strong and could not be cut at all. With even diamond tools wouldn't scratch it. It appeared to be some kind of highly advanced uh, iron metal matrix composite with, with carbon nanotubes. You mentioned there was a sort of biological capsule that surrounded it. Would right. that be used to protect it, to prevent it breakage? No, I don't think it's to protect it. I think it's to um, organize the uh, neural input to the device somehow. Is that we, if we were able to uh, back engineer some of the, uh, the technology that we have in these devices, we could prevent, for example, inflammatory processes and rejection. In other words, if we could make something similar, you could wrap a heart, a kidney, a screw, a pin, or whatever, and instill it into the human body, and the person would not have to take any anti-rejection medication for the rest of their life. So, and this was presented in a report, which is in the White House, that I have a copy of from the OSTP. That's the Office of Scientific Technology and Policy. And that was handed to Obama at the time when he was trying to uh, raise money for his uh, medical uh, health care problem to get, it, you know, get Congress to approve the money. Will President Obama, with the help of Congress, fund this medical research and reverse engineer these implants? If so, the implications could help medical technology beyond our imagination. Now, we go to the most incredible account of alien abduction explained by Dr. Roger Lear to Jack Graham. Three young children, about nine or 10 years of age, who lived in Tennessee. And uh, they decided to go out on a little local camping trip. So not too many blocks away, it was kind of like an empty field and so on. So they packed their primitive sort of gear, which was blankets and things of that nature and things to cook over a fire, marshmallows and so on. And they went out and they, they didn't even have a tent. They used sticks, they gathered sticks and they put the blanket over the sticks to act as a, as a tent. And they roasted their marshmallows and told jokes and, and so on. Well, at about uh, 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, they noticed that there was a very bright star up ahead, above them. And uh, the three of them all uh, concentrated on this star because it was so bright. And the three of them watched as this star descended closer and closer and closer. And as it got closer, they saw that it was a craft. The next thing that happened was that when the craft was about 50 feet over their heads, a beam of bluish-white light in a cone came down over the three of them, and they began to levitate up in this cone of light. Now, uh, if someone had done that to me at my age, I'd be have a little bit of trepidation because, you know, if you're going up, in a cone of light, I mean, the first thing that would come to my mind would be the fear of Panic. falling mm -hmm. back down. Yeah. You know, there's nothing holding you. But they had, uh, they had the absolute opposite feeling. Oh, wow, this is fun. We're having fun, you know, we're going up in this light. So they get up into the craft, and then they're in a, a round room that kind of uh, looks like a hangar. And uh, there are typical bumper sticker gray beings that are there. And so they say, well, you know, what's, what's happening? Man, what's, what's, what's going on? I said, you know, have no fear, you're gonna be returned, you'll be fine. 
Uh, we're just going to you know, take a look at you folks for a few minutes and so on. But their, their fear was in being separated. Greater fear for each other than for each as an individual. Then when they finally were separated, they were taken down different corridors. They went off this room and under hypnotic regression is when they described what they saw off the corridors, which were rooms that looked like hospital rooms. And uh, the one that we went through most of the uh, hypnotic regression uh, was placed in a room unclothed uh, and placed on a table that he couldn't tell whether it was jutting out of the wall or whether it was on a pedestal. And uh, although he thought it was metallic, it was neither hot nor cold, it was very form-fitting. Uh, but then an instrument was used to, uh, that he described, that actually put the uh, implant in his uh, wrist. And uh, when he did this, uh, he didn't feel too much of anything. But uh, if he got uh, nervous uh, and so on, always one of the gray beings would come very close to him. And with their black eyes, they would get very close and look into their eyes. And this aura of calmness would come over them. Uh, once this was done, uh, they were uh, examined and taken out. And the three kids were back together again in this large uh, hangar-like room. And the next thing they remember, they're lying back on the campsite again. And the craft is uh, slowly moving up and bang, it was, it was gone. So uh, they didn't know what to think, they don't know whether they had a nightmare or something happened or you know, just didn't understand the entire situation. One of the things that makes this case so unusual is that all three kids did something very strange after that, like a suggestion was put in their heads or whatever. But they went into, they actually stole into this person's backyard that had a vegetable garden. And they tore up the vegetables and ate them. And that's one of the most unusual cases that I've heard of yet. So they must have been told to, to do this for some reason. Because some folks that are involved in the abduction phenomena come back with symptoms. They feel muscle aches, pain, fatigue, uh, feelings of the flu, dehydration, and so on. But the three kids, and asking them questions, uh, you know, of course they weren't kids when we, we did the surgery, but in asking them, you know, if they had any ill effects from it, uh, they don't recall anything. So maybe that what they got out of the vegetables was something that, um, that uh, obliterated the symptoms that the abductees have. Now what procedures and protocols do you follow for the surgery? Well the procedures and protocols that we follow have to be kept 100 percent in order to make this a scientific study because we try and stay with the scientific method. One of the things we do is when a patient contacts me, they have to convince me that they have an object. And that's either through an x-ray or a CAT scan. We don't accept MRIs because the MRIs can produce false positives for foreign objects. For example, in an MRI, if you're looking uh, through a slice right through the top of a blood vessel and there's blood flowing through a, a vessel, you'll see a nice bright spot. But there's not a foreign object. All it is is a cut through a blood vessel. So if they send me x-rays or a CAT scan, then I take them to the radiologist and I get it confirmed that this is a foreign body. And what is the guesstimation of the material? Is, is it more dense than the surrounding bone? Is it less dense than the surrounding bone? Uh, we know if it's more dense than the surrounding bone, it's probably on the metallic side. Uh, also, we have other consultants that we use, for example, we've had a couple of cases that were dental cases, and uh, these were dental x-rays, so we have uh, dental experts that go ahead and will look at the x-rays and then they'll make suggestions as to whether they need further films, a uh, Panorex or a CAT scan. So once it's been established that there is an object there, 
Then the next thing we do is we send that client uh, a package of questions and they have to answer all the questions. There are no right and there are no wrong answers, but it gives us a, a complete background of what the possibility of their actually being involved with the abduction program is. Also, one of the forms amongst this questionnaire is a, great, is a gradable uh, form on probabilities. So if they're over 35% probable, then they've been involved. Now, lots of people step on things. Lots of people have, uh, you know, they want two seconds of fame on television or to get film. There's a lot of reasons for people that uh, contact me. They may be not abductees at all. Uh, some abductees uh, don't get along well with the problems. And as the late John Mack wrote in his book, there are seven traumas that are involved with alien abduction, and only one of them is the event itself. <clears throat> Another one is who are you going to tell? Who are you going? Yeah. Who's going to believe you? So you have this argument that goes on continuously. So a lot of these people are not well adjusted. A lot of abductees have problems. They can become alcoholics, drug addicts. They can be confined in mental institutions. So uh, you, you have to you know, sift out these people to become part of this study. And this is one of the first things we do. Then once they are accepted as a possible surgical candidate, do they want the surgery? Do they want it removed? And if so, if they agree that they do want it removed, they have to understand that the product that we're going to remove becomes the the ownership becomes part of ANS research, and that we promise to give to the rest of the world as scientific knowledge. And if they're not willing to do that, then there we don't accept them as a patient. So if we look at statistical numbers, you know, let's say 10% out of 100 might be a true surgical candidate. 1% of them will only be ones that we'll operate on. Now have any scientists tried to uh, you know, talk to you and give possible explanations for what it is instead of aliens and have tried to prove you wrong? Uh, when I talk to the academic scientific uh, community, they're also interested in the, uh, in the analysis and the intrigue of what they're looking at, at a, on a scientific academic basis. Uh, that they don't even offer a lot of time suggestions. If we do it and they're being paid, for example, for a television program, they'll actually get them to lie on camera. Wow. Uh, also, scientists, uh, by and large, are prey to hire masters, as other people, you know, in other fields of uh, like occupations do. They have to earn their paycheck. They have to feed their families. So, and they could be threatened. They can be threatened by any agency of the government, for example. Not so much anymore, but in earlier years, yes. To what extent do you think is the government hiding information from us? Do you think they know, do you think they have contact with aliens? I think that the government historically has made contact with aliens and there's most probably been deals that have been made. We, we have enough witnesses now, uh, for example, a Holloman Air Force situation in which uh, at Holloman Air Force Base uh, where Air Force One was seen to land, the base was literally frozen. Uh, no one could move from their post when this was going on. <laughs> there was lots of witnesses to things that were happening. Two guys, two electricians, up on a uh, pole were told to stay there and not move till all this was over, wow. and that was near the runway. Then they saw three circular craft come flying overhead. Uh, one of them uh, began to hover over the runway when Air Force One stopped. Another one took off and went 20 miles away and ho hovered over a park. And the third one was somewhere else lingering around. And uh, it was said by the lineman who had a good view of this whole thing that Eisenhower, President Eisenhower at the time, got out of that plane 
walked over to the craft. He saw a ramp come down. He walked up the uh, ramp and shook hands with some kind of a non-human wow. being. Went in, was there for about 20 minutes, came back out again. The uh, craft, uh, alien craft took off. Air Force One took off. And instead of following the rules and regs that they had set up for landings at that base, they took off and flew directly within 50 feet off the roof of the hospital. Jeez. So this is, this has been you know cited as one of the examples. But certain presidents were in the know. Certain presidents were not probably in the know. And today. I believe that the situation is totally different. I believe that most of this information today is in the hands of the giant uh, monarchs of industry, these multilateral uh, country uh, uh, companies that uh, are, you know, some of them are part of the military industrial complex and some of them are industry itself. And it's the greed that keeps yeah. propelling this on and on and on. But it looks like they're getting to the point now where they're starting to eat each other. Because I guarantee you that Standard Oil, with its uh, concentration on fossil fuel energy, is not really interested in what Monsanto is doing, making GMO foods. And Monsanto, with uh, GMO foods, is uh, not really interested in a free energy system that somebody else might develop. So things are changing rapidly. And uh, of course, with the citizen hearing that's going to be held at the end of the month in Washington, D.C., uh, and it will be streamed out to the world, we expect half the population of the world to watch this congressional hearing and hope, with hope, that the government will actually start releasing information. With trillions of planets in the universe, it's hard to believe that planet Earth is unique. Odds are that life exists elsewhere. And while life on some planets may be less advanced than us, chances are that more advanced life forms will also exist. So the question becomes, will these advanced life forms have the ability to travel to Earth? And, if so, secretly tag us with extraterrestrial hardware during their visits? Prior to interviewing Dr. Lear, I might have said no. But while I still have my doubts, Dr. Lear makes a fascinating case for this, and now I'd like to know more. Jack, in his quest for the answer, has reached out to Third Phase of Moon to speak with the alien abductees who've had implants removed by Dr. Roger Lear. We have provided him the contact information. Mary, who wants to remain anonymous, and Tim Cullen have come forward to speak with Jack and answer his questions in regards to their alien abduction and the implants removed by Dr. Roger Lear. Hi, I'm Jack. Tell me about your abduction. I have had, my family, it runs in my family. My brother has had experiences. His family, um, since the marriage, has had experiences. Um, my hu husband underwent experiences, as did I, from being married into my family. <laughs> it seems like that was the protocol for marrying into the family. And, um, because I had had unusual experiences from the time I was really, really small, and my brother, too, from the time he was an infant. And I believe they started with my mom and dad because uh, my dad had had some sightings. I had had a sighting. My mother had a sighting of a UFO over our home. Um, it, was, it ran in the family, and uh, there were a lot of experiences that my husband and I had in... Um, in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, and he would actually get night terrors, which we thought were from, um, he's a Vietnam veteran, had experiences in Vietnam, and thought it was post-traumatic stress syndrome. It turns out it wasn't from Vietnam. He actually then started remembering in the early 90s that the night terrors he was experiencing was from these creatures being in our home and taking us at night. What was your reaction when you realized you had been abducted by extraterrestrials? Let's see, it was removed in 1996, probably about six months to a year sooner before that. I realized um, I had a scoop mark on my leg, 
And I did not know there was an implant in there. I had no idea. I just saw this scar on my leg and um, on my left calf. And uh, when Roger was, uh, we had, I was assistant section director and then section director of MUFON for Ventura, Santa Barbara counties. And Roger was helping me and he had arranged to do surgeries and uh, he had gotten funding through Bigelow. And um, for three surgeries, we had, we had three people that were going to have supposed implants removed. Roger had gone through the x-ray process and exam process. Well, one of them was Whitley Strieber. He had an object in his ear and he was to be one of our guest speakers and then go ahead and have a surgery. Last minute, he decided against having the object removed from his ear and it's on the outside of his ear. He still has it today. Um, it's under the skin on the back of the ear. And uh, he decided against it. Well, we had funding for three surgeries, and Roger was, uh, Dr. Lear was beside himself as to, you know, what was he going to do? And I said, well, you can remove this scar off my leg, this, whatever it is. I don't know how I got it, but make that the third surgery. And uh, he, he said, that's fine. He says, but we have to go through the examination process. We'll need to get x-rays, blood tests, which we did. And on the x-ray, um, surprising both to myself and him, he saw an object on the x-ray that was just under the scar, the scoop mark I had. And that's how we discovered that there was actually an object under the scoop mark. What was your reaction to the news that aliens had implanted a device in you? I was shocked that there was anything under that scoop mark to begin with. I, I didn't know how I obtained that mark, but it was an unusual mark and it appeared seemed to just appear, at least I just noticed it. Um, I think he was shocked because he that was the first time he had ever had a scoop mark with an object under it. So he was shocked, I was shocked, and I kept trying to, um, you know, rationalize that, oh, maybe I just got something in my leg and after it was, you know, extracted and um, examined, it was nothing, I kept saying, are you sure this wouldn't be found in, in a regular body? You know, is there any way? And he goes, no, 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 Alice. This would not be found in your lake. It could not, you know, it would not be uh, there naturally by any means. It wasn't a calcification or anything like that. It had a lot of unusual um, characteristics, and he's since then done some more... Um, uh, surgeries that have had uh, the same type of object. Is there anything else you want to add? Well, I think he's, he's, you know, he's doing something that is so important and he helps so many people and he never asks for anything, you know, in return from anybody that he, he uh, tries to help. Um, he's just, you know, he's, he's doing it because he has the, not only the ability to do it, but he has the need to find out what is really going on, the curiosity as to what's going on. It's affected him, everything he does, his life, his career. Um, he's very dedicated to trying to find out, you know, what these objects are. And also with these objects, we're finding that they have uh, no inflammatory um, response around the object, could this possibly, could this technology help uh, the medical profession now in dealing with transplants where, you know, these people with transplants have to be on horrific medications for many, many years where, you know, if this technology could be developed where um, there would be no rejection. I mean, it would be wonderful for the people that have to go through this with the transplants. So, I mean, he's, he's doing it for a lot of reasons, but he does it. It's a, it's a labor of love for him and curiosity. And he also, he feels very dedicated to trying to help people because a lot of people, you know, they, with these type of situations, they just don't know who to turn to or what to do. Unfortunately, he's there to try to help. Where is your chip implanted? 
The implant was in the, it was located in my left wrist area, arm wrist area, uh, almost identical to another, uh, another, uh, sur the 15th surgery Dr. Lear done on Ron Noel. His implant was the same shape as mine, a cantaloupe seed type object, and located in uh, basically the left wrist area. In fact, uh, we kind of wonder if we can almost put the x-rays over each other and they'd almost be in the same spot. Did it hurt after the surgery? Yeah, when they got a hold of the object, it felt, you know, I felt it a lot of pressure and uncomfortable with my arm. Like it was, you know, got chicken winged and I kind of had to carry it in a sling for a little while, but then it, it calmed down. It really, you know, like I said, it was just uh, like it was just being, uh, the arm was being abused. I realized this thing was hooked to my nervous system because when I became aware of it, you know, it was like it was aware of me and I was aware of it. The link between the implants and the abductees themselves are questions we may never know. But the real question here is, are we alone? And the answer is, these implants are extraterrestrial in origin. Thanks to young Jack Graham asking the questions and Dr. Roger Lear's answers. We are not alone in the universe. My name is Blake Cousins, and we'll see you again next time.